I'd like to welcome everyone to Teaching Students from Around the World, Perspectives on Academic Integrity. I'm Ellen Dussard. I'm Director of the Office of International Student and Scholar Services. And in an effort to promote cross-cultural understanding at UB, our office organized this workshop in conjunction with Keith Otto of the English Language Institute and Professor Nam Suk Kim of the Graduate School of Education. We have five student presenters today all responded to our announcement on our international student listserv, inviting international students to help develop the workshop. The students who responded are all undergraduate and master's students who are diverse in their national origin, gender, and major. Our workshop will therefore primarily focus on undergraduate integrity at the undergraduate level since we have no PhD students as presenters. Um, as I mentioned, since we have so many presenters, we have rehearsed our workshop to be sure we don't go over the time limit. And uh, we expect to have 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, that being the case, we would ask you to please hold your questions until the end. The workshop content is original. It is based on our presenters' ideas and experiences, so it represents their unique perspectives. Whoops. Whoa. Although we feel their perspectives are representative, we acknowledge that our, there are certainly students from the same countries as our presenters whose perspectives may be different. We also surveyed international students on academic integrity and will present the results of that survey so you will have the opportunity to hear other perspectives. Our goals today are twofold. Uh, first, we would like to increase awareness of the cultural dimensions of academic integrity and help you communicate your academic integrity policies more effectively to international students. Uh, let me begin with a few cultural assumptions. I think uh, you all would agree that it's risky to assume that all cultures are the same and that the same action or behavior has the same meaning everywhere and that what you understood in a situation is what was meant and similarly that what you meant in a situation is what was understood. Um, it's also useful, I think we will all agree, that most people behave rationally in the context of their culture. So when you encounter international students who do things that don't make sense in this context, it's helpful to consider that what they are doing may be entirely rational where they're coming from. I'm going to develop this notion of uh, cultural assumptions uh, in, in momentarily as it pertains to our topic. Uh, I'd ask you to reflect on a few questions. Uh, the first is how you define academic integrity in your classes and to your students. And uh, to uh, also ask yourselves, do your colleagues define it the same way? Um, do you have a clear policy on academic integrity? And do your colleagues also have a clear policy? How do you enforce your academic integrity policy? Do your colleagues enforce their policy in the same way you do? So let's uh, talk about uh, what I feel are some useful assumptions um, uh, from a cultural perspective in, uh, about academic integrity. I think it's safe to say that the general concept of cheating is the same in all cultures. Uh, I, I worked overseas uh, for eight years on three different continents. I never encountered a single instance where I, I concluded that, that the, the people I was working with or interacting with had a different idea about cheating than I did. And I mean cheating in a general sense, cheating in a social sense, a cheating in an academic sense, cheating in a financial sense. But it is true that there may be no word for academic integrity in some languages. There may only be words for cheating and dishonesty, and you'll hear examples of that today. It's, all, it's a fact that there are cultural differences in the way originality is in, interpreted. Um, according to our co-presenter, Professor Nam Suk Kim, the, um, in South Korea, uh, the traditional, not the current, but the tr traditional concept of originality or the traditional belief about originality is that there's no such thing as an original thought because all thoughts incorporate others' thoughts. So we are you know, quite committed to this concept of original thoughts and original work, but I think it's helpful to keep in mind that uh, international students and others uh, international scholars at UB, for example, may have an entirely different concept of originality and certainly of intellectual property. It's also true that the interpretation of what constitutes cheating may vary from country to country and, even, and from assignment to assignment. 
just as it does from professor to professor in the US. So I want to give you a few examples that we give international students when they come here. We tell them every professor has his or her own definition of academic integrity and his or her own policy, and you need to find out what it is in each of your classes. In some classes, you may have take-home exams. In others, you may have closed book exams, and in others, you may have open, open book exams. It, it, when you go to a closed book exam with, with uh, quote, a cheat sheet, that's cheating in that class, whereas in the class where there's an open book exam, opening, uh, consulting your notes and consulting your textbook is entirely permitted. Uh, let's also talk about group projects. Um, in a lot of classes, students are assigned group projects. And they work together on the project. They're assigned the same grade um, based on the group effort. In, in certain departments at UB, students are not allowed to, to talk about a homework assignment with another uh, with a classmate to look at another classmate's homework assignment that constitutes cheating and was will result in a failing grade in the course so we tell our students this is a complex landscape you have to figure out what the rules are in each of your classes and in order to know what you can and cannot do uh, the consequences to cheating also vary from country to country, as they do in the U.S. from professor to professor, from class to class, and from school to school. Um, I think it's widely known that some, some professors uh, look the other way when they encounter incidents of cheating, um, whereas other, some professors pursue the students. Now, if you consider the fact that in every culture there are rules that people follow and rules that hardly anyone follows. For example, the 55 mile an hour speed limit. I don't know how many of you uh, never drive above 55 miles an hour on the throughway, but I think that's a rule that is generally ignored. But please consider that when someone comes here from another country, they don't know which are the real rules and which are the rules that are sort of you know, rules that everybody just ignores and, and there are no consequences to doing so. So again, um, in conclusion, I, I would say that our students may have an imperfect understanding of what constitutes academic dishonesty in the U.S. They may not understand the possible consequences to cheating in the U.S. They may not know the likelihood that they will face consequences if they cheat in the U.S and they may have no idea of the potential severity of such consequences. And this is where faculty and academic advisors and those of us who organize international students, international student orientation come in because we have to make it absolutely clear what is permissible and not permissible here. And at the end of this presentation, we'll have some tips on, tips for faculty on how to effectively communicate their policy to our students. And now uh, Mahathi is going to talk to us about learning style. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Mahathi, and I'm from India. I grew up in a very urban cosmopolitan city in South India called Bangalore. And over the course of my schooling, I've been to seven different schools and experienced five different boards in India alone, education boards. So I've, I've personally encountered a wide variety of learning styles. So to begin with, um, most of the other presenters here today that, or the, that we, I've discussed the concept of um, the learning style with agree that most of us come from countries where the learning is focused on memorization. So we're expected to memorize and reproduce verbatim sections from textbooks and from the classes in, um, in exams and in assignments. So uh, I grew up, I, I grew up um, in a country where we were expected to, uh, where originality was uh, not um, valued as much as simply reproducing what the teacher expected us to reproduce in exams and in assignments. And to give you an example, in the, in the fifth grade, I had a social studies teacher who would assign questions from the end of the chapter, and she would mark out sections of the textbook that we simply had to copy into our notebook as the answers to those questions. And those were the same answers we had to reproduce in the exam. As a, uh, in the exam, and they, they had, we have also been to schools where language teachers, even you know, for English and for second languages, would simply write down the essays, and we could, although we didn't have to, we could just memorize the essays and reproduce them, even though 
you, you know, an essay is not an assignment that's generally thought of in such a way. And I've, I've been to schools where this is not the case, but I've also been to schools where this is the case because it's such a large country. And if, if even if within the country if there's so much variation in learning styles, you can imagine how much it varies from country to country. Um, for the most part, our students aren't ex exposed to much information outside of the textbook. There's not much internet, internet research or um, creative assignment. So um, access is generally limited to just the single textbook that's assigned by the school. Um, Kyunga, who is another pre presenter today from Korea, she was mentioning that uh, there was an incident recently where uh, students from Korea who'd prepared to take the CPA exam were flown to, to Guam. And um, they'd, all studied, they'd all studied in the same center in Korea f in preparation for the exam, and they'd all memorized the same answers to the same questions. And they all put down the same answers in the exam down to the preposition verbatim. And it was such a big deal because the, obviously there, was, there were concerns about the honesty and about cheating and the proctor had to fly down to Korea and check for the center and it was a huge deal. And this is a professional exam at you know, a very high level. It's not even school or college. And at that level, if you know, this was the level of, this was the learning style that was employed, you can imagine that you know, that's how culturally embedded the notion of memorization and by hearting is in our cultures. I mean, there's, there's a, a very high premium placed on, you know, on memory and on just absorbing information. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that um, the learning, I mean, uh, students who come to the US may be exposed for the first time to an entirely different style and they have to reor reorient themselves to what is expected of them in an entirely different academic context I mean, the whole, the, it's, it's a shift of perspective that has to take place from merely absorbing information to actively pursuing information or actively looking for information, actively creating work. So this is, I think, a, a reorientation that, you know, um, school resources and professors need to assist students in making. Thank you. Thank you, Mahathi. My name is Kyunga Lee from South Korea. I'm a second year master's student in higher education administration program. I have a story about my brother that illustrates what Mahathi just said. My brother graduated from high school in South Korea and came here last summer to study in the ELI, English Language Institute at UB. He was so excited and received his first homework assignment which, which asked him to write sentences using given vocabulary words. So he confidently looked up the words in the online dictionary and he copied those sentences, which is how Korean students do homework in South Korea. However, his ELI teacher wrote no plagiarism on his paper and my brother asked me what it meant. Then he realized it was different here. I'm sharing this story because he's doing well now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The role and purpose of the homework can be very different. In some countries, homework tends not to have big impact on the final grade. According to our discussion, in India and Pakistan, homework does not count at all towards the final grade. In Japan, it counts very little. In Korea, it counts towards the final grade, but anyone who submits the homework gets an A easily which means that homework assignment part is base points that everyone can get for free and that have no real impact on the final grade. Homework, assi homework assignment tends to be easy. An example of a homework assignment in South Korea would be teachers collecting the students' class notes, including what teachers wrote on the blackboard and giving full points for the homework, homework part. Another example from a history class would be um, right about World War II. In such cases, students tend to copy word for word from Wikipedia or blogs, and teachers seldom st spend time carefully checking the content of the homework. Instead, teachers spend time writing difficult exam questions 
in order to differentiate the students from one another in class ranking, because class ranking is what really matters for students to get into a good college. Also, teachers do not warn students about copying the homework from the internet or friends, although they know students will do so, because copying is not a bad concept in South Korea. Rather, sometimes using online resource is encouraged. Students submit the homework without any citation and references, and they get full points for it. Even though some teachers might not like to see everything copied from the online source, the consequences for doing so are minimal. For instance, teacher may just deduct five points from the homework assignment. Because of competitive study environment in other countries, taking time to do homework might be viewed as wasting your time that you could have spent studying for the national exams. And now Momoko will talk about writing assignments. Good morning, I'm Momoko and I'm from Japan. I'm a graduate student in Library and Information Studies program. And now I'm gonna talk about writing assignments. The purpose of K-12 writing assignments is usually to practice what one is learning rather than to produce original ideas. So that is, as educational systems emphasize rote memorization, students may be expected to reproduce what they memorize from textbooks or other academic materials in writing assignments rather than to produce original, their original ideas. Writing assignments may serve as a learning sport that enables a student to practice learning. So it may not matter if one uses other works in them. Again, the purpose is to help students reproduce what they memorize or learn so as to reinforce their understanding and ability to use the knowledge and ideas by themselves. So using others' ideas may even be viewed positively and result in extra points because it showed that the student actually did some research to look for other resources for the assignments. For example, one of the students from China who worked with us on this presentation say that it is considered good to start an essay with a quote and then explain it in the essay in China. But in this case, the quotes are not put in quotation marks or cited. On the other hand, in Japan and South Korea, K-12 students may use quotation marks when quoting someone, but it's unlikely that anyone would check a K-12 writing assignments for plagiarism. Teachers may not care about it. And in some countries, downloading writing assignments from the internet may be common, and K-12 teachers tend not to show any concern about such activities, although they may be aware of them. And speaking from my experience in Japan, there are two types of writing assignments in K-12 education. One is an essay that students are given a topic to write about, and the other is a reflective paper that students write about a book they read. And in the latter case, which is reflective paper, they write about what they learned and what they thought about it, about the book they read. And for me, the, the distinction between essays and reflective papers isn't so clear as for both types of writing assignments, students are expected to write about what they learned from a given book or other materials they found. So citing or summarizing others' work is so common in order to demonstrate their learning and to convey their thoughts. But when we quote from a book or other resources in K-12 in Japan, we use quotation marks, but students may not always cite sources, especially when they paraphrase their, so their materials from textbook or information resources. So some K-12 teachers even expect students to include bibliographies at the end of the paper, although there's no specific citation styles. And other teachers do not have this requirement. And now Anuruda will talk more about citing other works. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Anurudh Nandi, and I'm going to present on citing others' work. 
So when I came over, I'm going to start off with an experience of my own because I don't want to focus on facts. I rather want to focus on insight and experiences. So when I came over to UB, I registered for ENG 201 course and I felt pretty confident about myself because before leaving India, I had a pre-departure orientation which gave me a brief idea about what plagiarism was. So I wasn't worried about it. However, I soon enough learned that plagiarism and citing was not as simple as I had anticipated. I made quite a few mistakes, which were like uh, not indenting block citations, not paraphrasing properly, combining MLA and APA citation styles, and so on. At that point, I went and seeked help from my professor, and she referred me to a resource known as Purdue Owl, and also conducted several class workshops to inform me about how citation and plagiarism work. The reason for this is in India, I'm used to using direct quotation marks instead of proper citation. And uh, the resources to overcome these were extremely beneficial to help me get acquainted with the American system of citation. Plagiarism as comprehended by countries UB students come from vary drastically. For example, in India, there is no specific term which exists for plagiarism. Where in China, according to one of the contributors in this project, it is encouraged as a practice to use to exercise plagiarism to honor the person who has done the work involved. In India, there was no specific term introduced to suggest something like plagiarism, and its understanding was extremely limited to the narrow definition of copying. Use of several sources was highly encouraged and citing work was not required. If an idea from a renowned person in the f specific field was used, uh, the quotation marks were necessary and I had to include the name, for example, person X said so and so within quotation marks. However, if the person is not as renowned or if it's a result of some general research, it would be enough to include a general statement such as research has shown so and so. The American concept of plagiarism has not been introduced during K through 12 years, and even at undergraduate level. On the contrary, citing as a practice is often considered irrelevant and pertaining only to graduate students. Which is why I would like to conclude with the fact that it is essential to introduce the concept of citation and plagiarism in depth and discuss resources such as Purdue OWL to help international students get acquainted with it. And now I would like to invite Farhane to elaborate more on tests and exams. Good morning. My name is Farhane Ansari. I'm from Pakistan. And I'm an undergraduate senior biomedical sciences major. And today I will be talking, talking to you about tests and national exams. Curricula may be test-based. Papers, projects, presentations, and homeworks may not count as much towards the final grade. This encourages students to devote and study for, mo for the most part for the test and doing well on them. Tests may consist of multiple choice questions as well as short answer questions. Usually in order to obtain maximum points on the short answer questions, um, students tend to reproduce ma uh, memorized, word, uh, memorized work. This limits their chances of making a mistake and teachers may not mind this because students are likely to answer correctly when they have answers committed to memory. There are, t uh, there are typically no consequences to using memorized work on um, uh, memorized work on K through 12 tests. Some teachers may notice they may take off a point or two. They may give a warning, but since there is no serious consequence, uh, consequence students are likely to not pay attention to this. Now, let's talk about national exams. Circumstances under which students take national exams are very different. National exams are considered important for students' entrance into the next level of education, which makes it important to um, ensure academic integrity, and it is taken much more seriously than a regular class test or exam. There is high security. It may consist of no cell phones, no internet, any kind of electronic device, and there's also surveillance, police, and students are checked multiple times before they enter into the exam room. 
There are alternative testing sites. Students from different schools would be told to go to a particular testing site, different from their regular school. There is randomized seating arrangement. Students from different classes within the same school and within different school are shuffled. And the seating arrangement is such that students are far enough so that taking a glance at a student's paper next to them or in front of them is impossible. There are also multiple versions of the test. Sometimes there are multiple proctors, some in the front of the room, some in the back, some are circulating. Sorry. And proctors are different from the student's regular class teachers. They may be from another school and students are not aware of who they're gonna be proctored by. Exams are graded by different people, not the student's regular teacher or proctor. On a national exam, there is usually one person who will grade one question only on the exam, and this will ensure the greater security. Now, Kyungya uh, will talk about relationships among students. Thank you, Farheen. In terms of relationship among students, students in other countries collaborate more than American students, unless it affects their final grade. For instance, Students in other countries may not hesitate to ask another student for their class notes or homework assignment. Also, they will not mind sharing them because class notes and homework assignment do not play a big role in determining their final grade. Also, students from other countries tend to be more collectivistic than American students. Because of this culture, if anyone refuses to share, he or she may be viewed as mean and treated as a social outcast. Because we have a competitive study environment and class ranking really matters in South Korea, some students may worry that a friend might get a higher grade using their notes since tests are based on what the teacher said in class. In that case, they will not want to share their class notes especially with a student who slept in class or didn't do any work. However, if the other student had a family emergency or sickness, a valid reason, most students will be very willing to share their class notes and homework assignment. Now Dr. Kim will talk about the survey results. Good morning, everyone. I am Nam Suk Kim, faculty member in the Graduate School of Education, Department of Educational Leadership and Policy, and Center for Comparative and Stu Global Studies and Education. Today, I um, I'm going to present some of the select results of the recent online survey with our international students. First, when we asked the students about their value for academic integrity by asking, do you think it is important to comply with UBs and your professors' academic integrity policies? Almost all students said yes. As Ellen introduced, the general concept of cheating or academic integrity seems universal. It's good news for us that our international students agreed to the importance of following academic integrity policies here. Then, when the students were asked, if they, uh, whether they were taught about academic integrity in their high school or college or university in their own countries, more than 70% of the respondents said they were taught. Not 100%, but um, this, uh, this may not seem bad news. But what I'd like to ask you to understand is what they were taught about academic integrity policies of their countries, not the policies that we practice here. Then a germane question for us is, would be whether the students were given any information about how academic integrity is interpreted and enforced in the US before they come to the US. As you can see, just more than half of the respondents were exposed to American concept and practice of academic integrity. Now we have a better idea, understanding. They are not fully ready upon their arrival. In addition, they may have incorrect assumptions that they have a good understanding of the actions that constitute academic dishonesty in each of their UB classes based on their understanding of the concept and practices in their home countries. Almost all, almost all students think they have a good understanding, as you can see. However, again, 
I ask you to be mindful of interpreting the, this result as they may not be um, very competent about understanding and how to practice academic integrity here, in fact. Thus, this result may help you to better, better understand what our international students think constitute academic dishonesty based on their knowledge and experience. Students were asked to choose all that apply. The higher in this table, the more commonly or clearly considered to be academic dishonesty. Clearly to them, copying a friend's answer to a class quiz, bringing a paper or cell phone to an exam, or pretending to be another student is considered to be academic dishonesty. But fewer than half of the students' respondents considered summarizing someone else's ideas in their own words without giving proper citations of the true author or helping a classmate with a, with a homework assignment to be academic dishonesty. To add more details, additional open-ended comments um, in, to relevant questions include students' remarks on community of learning or intellectual collaboration that they value highly. They claim, verbatim, giving the answer is one thing. Helping to understand certain aspects of the assignment is another. They even wonder, how, why would there be consequences if someone helps his or her classmate with homework? As we are encouraged to help each other with homework so everybody understands the concept. Thus, our international students' perspectives on academic dis, in, um, dishonesty and integrity may be very different from ours. Now we understand what our students need to be taught and what we need to be clear about. Then I hope we also understand the students may not have a good understanding about the consequences to violating the policies here. For example, when we ask, what are the consequences in your home country to helping a, a classmate with or receiving help on a class um, test or exam? First. The range of the consequences is wide, and also the consequences seem to be lighter than we practice here. When caught, they may receive an F or zero grade, or encounter dismissal from class or the school. The consequences depend on the type of the exam, professors or the university. But they also added that it is very common, and generally we are given a low score, but never failed. Or there may be no consequence at all. Now I present to you another notable difference in the consequences to buying or selling academic papers for submission for a course. The responses vary. Notably, receive an F is lower than 50%. Other responses include surprising comments, such as verbatim, it's actually encouraged to buy the old exams for more practice. As students in some cultures were encouraged to reproduce the text to honor the idea of others and also um, learn the subject and the content matters more thoroughly, it is highly likely that they memorized the keys to the old exams the whole essays or whole paragraphs. It is also possible that some of the respondents might have misunderstood the question, but still, this research sheds some insights for us on different perspectives, understandings, and their practices here. The other important research that I want to share with you today is about international students' lack of knowledge or different understanding about the requirement to cite the true author, as these sh figures show and also additional comments suggest. Students added verbatim, there is no citation required. And also they said, there, um, there is often a pre prevalent understanding all what we have known are the collective intelligence of others. In other words, we seem to assume that all knowledge is built on others, 
Thus, the concept of citation is not that as important as it is um, in the U.S. context, specifically in the field of academia, they said. This is another area on which our international students, students need good guidance and instruction. And now, Keith is going to share some detailed suggestions for U.S. faculty. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so as we wrap up here in the last few minutes, we just wanted to summarize with a couple general tips. Uh, first of all, discussing the philosophy on originality so that your students understand the reason for your policies. So you might think of this as the, the why, why you have a particular policy for, for academic integrity in your class. Uh, secondly, clearly stating the policy in your syllabus with uh, the actions that are allowed and not allowed. So this is sort of the, the details, the what, the why and the what. Because as we've heard from our, our presenters today, there is a wide range uh, which students have experienced in their their uh, K through 12 systems or in undergraduate programs before coming here to UB. And I could hear some of you making little sounds of agreement or I could see some of you nodding during the presentation. We've also, you know, we who've grown up here in the US or in the American system of education, we've seen some diversity as well in our own experiences. So this is a classic example of what's good for international students is also good for the domestic students to make sure everybody is on the same page. Our third tip is consider discussing how the uh, violators will actually be detected. Um, this idea that we all know that there are some things that are right or wrong, but you know maybe it's not enforced or maybe it's not really important leads to questions like this, like, well, how is anybody going to even know? You know, in some majors, they have very uh, specific uh, you know means for detecting cheating, uh, including using software to analyze students' uh, homework assignments or projects. So helping the students to understand the detail, I think, Help, gives them a better understanding of, of what is important. Next, explaining what will happen if they commit an act of academic dishonesty, giving examples whenever possible, or telling, student, telling stories about what other students have done and what has happened to them. Again, on this campus, there's a wide range of, of what is normal in different departments. There's a wide range of professors with uh, very different uh, ways of punishing students, everything from just doing it over to just a, a verbal warning to failing the entire course. So, so our recommendation for faculty is to be as clear as possible in terms of what you and your specific course will do. Uh, again, with examples if possible to, to really emphasize, yes, this actually will happen. This isn't just a rule, but this is what has already happened to other students. Uh, last one here, be clear about the, the likelihood. So not just this is the policy, this is what could happen, but how likely is it that, uh, that violating the policy will lead to, uh, to some sort of punishment or consequence. So if students have this idea that it's, uh, it's not enforced or that it's really not important, you know, maybe it's a requirement from the department that they have to say this on the syllabus, but the professor doesn't actually think it's important. Uh, I think there's a lot that we can do to make that more clear. Of course, this doesn't solve everything entirely, but these are our tips, and we think that this would, would help to make it uh, a little bit less of a problem or to make it more of a shared understanding for students. Our final tip is if, you're, if you don't teach uh, things like how to cite, uh, or if you'd like um, resources to refer students to, uh, many of them exist online. Uh, UB's own library web pages have some good resources as well, but a classic one that you'll hear people reference again and again is the, the OWL website from Purdue, the online writing lab, I think is, is OWL. But the Purdue OWL, Google that and you'll find that, and there's uh, great resources there that you can share with students. And our final tip or final recommendation would be uh, for faculty to consider looking at some of the other webcasts which have been created here at UB. Uh, these, are, these all feature content generated by international students from UB. It's their, their words, their ideas. Uh, most of the students, uh, many of the students who contributed to these are our PhD students here who you know, aren't necessarily new students, so they have a, a more nuanced understanding of some of the differences between uh, the American education system and, and home country. So you'll see that there's a variety of, uh, of different, um, different countries that have been focused on over, over the years here. And we're right here at, uh, right on time here at quarter two. So 
We would be happy, we meaning the students primarily, hopefully, would be happy to answer questions you have. Um, and just to be clear, the, the slides that you've seen, these are mainly the points of, of shared understanding between the students. You heard some specific comments where they said, you know, in my country or in this country, but most of the slides that don't have that preface were things that were considered to be fairly, you know, common between the different countries. So, um, so that's, that's what you've got here today. In South Korea, we don't really do, um, we don't do like criticizing others' opinion. Especially we do book review. We do have some, but it's more like reflection paper. So I write about my opinion. Oh, I like this book. This point is great. But we don't really critic. But um, when I wrote my book review, I felt at first I felt, can I critic it? Because the book author has more knowledge the book author has higher authority than me. How can I critique that opinion? So that's how I felt, but later on I graduate, gradually learning about it, but that's what I felt at first. So I didn't do any criticism in my high school years. Generally, critical comments from teachers are widely accepted. However, from fellow students, it's more of a matter of their personality. They might take it to hurt their ego, or they might take it constructively. So it depends from person to person. Generally, it's not uh, introduced in high school in India. I am originally South Korea, and I interact with a lot of international students from diverse cultural backgrounds. And they are strong. They are strongly trained with um, with uh, with the memorization skills because this is one of the greatest ways to thoroughly understand the concept. Understanding the concept is mo the most important. This is one of the best ways they think that they will work with their students in their countries. So they are focused on the comparisons and the contrast. They are good with it. And most of the test items re uh, require students be able to respond to those needs. And, and the national exams, the local and uh, regional exams are focused on those uh, skills. So that's why, as you mentioned, critical, critical thinking and the creativity are one of those key areas many of the international students need to work on. And need, uh, so that's, that means we need to work on developing those skill areas when they are here. And because those are the important um, 21st century skills for our students. As you already know, there are different ways of knowing. And many of the international students are trained and encouraged to learn the ways from authority figures. Because again, understanding the concept matter is the most important. And then after then, they will be, if possible, if there is room um, and it's still in the school system, and they will be trained to do more. And some of the students, if they are lucky enough to, to meet those mentors, and they will be engaged in those um, enrichment opportunities to engage in critical thinking and discussions and debates, but this is limited because one of the goals is entering the prestigious, prestigious um, national university in that case. So when I'm working with the stu international student in my graduate and undergraduate classes, some of the ways that I, am, I intend to incorporate um, is using peers in the classroom. So I, I have them lead the discussion of the week so by ap week after week, they are the leaders of the sessions, but I am behind the scenes. So they are not, they are reluctant to lead a discussion, gracious, uh, gracious uh, discussions. But I am there the week before they are uh, they submit their proposal of their questions, how to elaborate their questions, how to facilitate facilitate and the questions, and how to group them, and the, with my feedback, and then they really design the forum in the session online or in class, they are the leaders and their peers perceive them as competent leaders. This is how I think we can help them grow to be critical thinkers and also critical leaders in, in, the, cla in the classrooms, in our UB classes. I was thinking I've taken a few philosophy classes and I thought that was very useful. So if you could do a, a tiny introduction to the concept of critical thinking itself, you know, the concept of questioning authority and of sources, of considering where information comes from and of the vested interests or the biases that the originator of that information has, and the very concept of questioning something that's in the textbook even, or something that's online, something that's considered published, but that not, may not necessarily be 100% accurate, or that can still be questioned, the, the very concept you know, is, I think, a good thing to introduce. 
And also maybe s stating clearly, which I mean, you probably already do that, is you know, telling your students that I would like to hear your opinion on this issue and specifically requesting it, say, I mean, is anybody, does it, has anybody had an experience to do with this? Or does, has anybody read of something that they think would be useful to add to the discussion? You know, maybe starting off slow and then leading up to more intense um, participation. One of the recommendations that I can make for you is um, to make um, networking. So you can have uh, ambassador programs from, from your programs, the different majors and international students, so that they can share their stories, some successes or some trials and errors and difficulties. So how to tackle the, the disciplines and the fields in the US and also the global, global positions. So that, that would be helpful for the international students. And I personally struggle with this question myself, although I've been lucky because my parents didn't force me in any particular stream. But I would suggest, um, I think the Career Office Services Office already um, suggests that students take the My Plan assessment, which is uh, actually uh, quite interesting. I mean, it's very uh, extensive and it tells you what your strengths and weaknesses are and that sort of thing. But also, I think to help with parents and that sort of thing, it might be helpful to um, uh, help students find what their prospects are with a different major and to think about you know, a job in the career, because that's what usually parents are worried about, and that's what they'd like to hear about, is concrete prospects. 